Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church of Gainesville, Florida. We are glad you're here and we come expectant that when we gather as a community of God, that God is with us and God moves powerfully among us. If you are new with us, we want to especially welcome you. I hope uh, all of you got a uh, copy of our worship guide. For those of you that are watching us um, remotely uh, or at home or wherever, uh, that worship guide is available on the homepage of our webpage. Go there, scroll down just a little bit, and um, it will be right there that you can either look at or print out. For those of you that are with us live, uh, it's back in our atrium, in our foyer. So if you didn't pick one up, pick it up now. And the way that we understand it, the way that uh, it empowers us to participate in worship is it not only lets us know where we're going, but it lets us know how to participate. And a couple of things I want to point out. You'll notice some things in bold. A few of them are titles, but some of them are things that the congregation actually says back during the course of the worship. So pay attention to that. And then all the asterisks also show you where the congregation stands during the course of the service. So hold on to this and it will take good care of you. On the back is a list of announcements. Uh, I hope you read through them all so you know what's going on in the life of your church, but I'm going to highlight just a few. First of all, we want to thank Marilyn Foote, Candy Caswinkle, and Helen McIntosh who provided the beautiful floral displays for both Palm and Easter Sunday worship. We are grateful for their time and efforts. If you would like to be part of that group next year that does those things, uh, they would love uh, more people to join them and get that experience. Just contact the church office and we'll make sure to connect you about it. Uh, we also would like to thank those volunteers who made the All Church Fellowship at Camp Montgomery yesterday a huge success. That was a lot of fun for all of those of you that made it out to that. Uh, that probably will not be the last time we do that, so um, look forward to that in the future. But thank you for the several of you that worked really hard to make sure that could happen. During Lent, moving towards Easter, we had a 40 days of caring food drive. And during that drive, we collected four and a half bins full of non-perishable food goods for Gainesville Community Ministry. Thank you for your donations and the heart you have for those in need. We really appreciate it. This time of year is when we start thinking about stewardship. Our uh, budget runs from July 1st to, Jan to June 30th. And um, so now is the time when we start moving into stewardship season. We start thinking about uh, what it will look like to support our church in the next year. Our dedication Sunday is going to be Sunday, May 22nd. 
but uh, soon you should receive a packet from the church that outlines um, both our needs and how you can consider partnering with us in those needs. And I just really hope that all the families will take this seriously and think about what it looks like to uh, both financially and through volunteerism support our church in the coming year. If you have any questions about any of that, please do not hesitate uh, touching base with me and processing any of that. I am sorry to let you know that our Bugle, our monthly newsletter, is going to be a little late this m next month. Jenny Chamberlain, our communications administrator, uh, injured her knee this week, and it uh, really slowed her up in getting things done. But she's going to be getting on that and uh, getting it out as soon as she can. But please keep Jenny in your prayers and everything. I am going to be missing you for the next couple of weeks. Uh, when I came here, there was only one thing on my to-do list that was going to distract me from being your pastor, and that was a trip to Israel that was supposed to happen in the summer of 2020. Well, obviously, that didn't happen, and it didn't happen when we rescheduled it to the fall of 2021, but tomorrow it is happening, so I'll be gone for two weeks to visit Israel. I'd appreciate your prayers about everything related to that. But most importantly, um, I really hope that I have an experience that I can bring back that translates uh, into the pulpit that helps us uh, see things in how they were cast in that culture and unpack them to understand in our culture. But uh, know that I will miss you and uh, look forward to being back with you soon. Um, Things will operate normally in our office. Uh, if you have anything that we need to know about, do not hesitate getting hold of us and letting our staff respond to that. Let us continue to worship the Lord. Please stand for our call to worship. Christ is risen, alleluia. Celebrate God in this sacred place. Celebrate God in all places under heaven. Give praise for God's mighty deeds. Give praise for God's resurrecting power. When we keep our fears and faults 
locked up inside of us, often we remain broken and fail to receive new life. So let us open ourselves to God in confession, trusting the Lord's desire to give us peace. Join us in our corporate prayer, followed by a time of silent and personal reflection. Join me. God of the empty tomb and our empty hearts, when we are afraid to speak our faith in the world, forgive us and help us to find our voice. When we are afraid to forgive and to love again, forgive us and give us the power to forgive. When we are afraid to stand up to misguided authority, join with the weak to make us all strong. When we are confined by our hurts, touch us with your wounded hands and set us free. When we are locked behind our doubts and fears, pass through our barricades, open our hearts and give us peace. Now, O Lord, transform us as we continue our confession in silence. Christ comes with healing light into our locked places and shadowy hurts, resurrecting our spirits and breathing into us new life. As God's own forgiven people, go to bring peace, forgiveness, and new life to the world in the name of Jesus Christ. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Let us now prepare our hearts for the reading of God's word with the prayer of illumination. Let us pray. Living God, as the risen Christ came into the locked room of the first disciples, may your word enter into us by the power of your Holy Spirit, so that we who have not seen may yet believe. Amen. Today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 150, which can be found on Old Testament page 583 in your pew Bibles. Please hear the word of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with string and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud, crashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Is it not my turn? We now invite you to a point in the service where we hold space for a lesson dedicated to our children. I invite all, children, all of our children to come forward for a special lesson at the front. Afterward, we will return to we will return to sit with our families. So when it is it on? It's on. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. All right. Someone in our Bible story today wanted proof of identification just like people in our world today want proof of identification. His name was Thomas. He was one of the disciples. And Jesus, what happened on Easter Sunday? On Easter. He rose from the dead. He came back to life, right? You thought I meant on Good Friday, right? But it was on Sunday. He rose from the dead. He came back to life. And then 
guess what happened? He went and saw all his friends. And they saw him and they were like, oh my goodness, Jesus is back. We're so happy. Thomas, you weren't here, you missed it. And Thomas said, I don't believe you. I need to see it with my own eyes. I want to see the holes where the nail went through his hand. I want to see the spot in his side. I need proof that Jesus really is alive. So guess what happened? One week later, Jesus showed back up, and Thomas was there this time. And Jesus said, Thomas, put your finger through the hole in my hand. And Thomas, touch the hole in my side. It's really me. I'm really back. And guess what? Thomas believed that time. But Thomas was just, he really needed to see it with his own eyes in order to believe that Jesus was back. And did you know that there's still people today that have a hard time believing that Jesus came back to life because they want to see it with their own eyes, like Thomas did. And do you know what Jesus says about that? Jesus said, blessed are they who have not seen and still believe. And I wonder, which one are you? Do you believe right away, even though you do you have faith that Jesus really came back to life and is alive? Or are you having doubts like Thomas? Hmm. And you answer. You can think about that and talk with your family about it. Yeah, you'd want to believe that Jesus came back to life and would never die, and you'd want to live with Jesus, right? Yeah. Well, let us pray about this. All right, let us pray. Will you pray with me? Congregation, will you join us? Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your Son to die on the cross for our sin. Help us to accept by faith that Jesus has risen from the grave and that he is alive. Amen. Our New Testament reading and preaching text comes from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. If you're with us here in person, you can follow along in the Pew Bible on, on New Testament page 115. John 20, 19 through 29. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you've seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. So as we begin today, I want to remind us all of when this happens. This scene happens after Jesus' resurrection. He was dead, but he's overcome death and come back to life. The disciples have been told by a group of their own, women who came with them from Galilee, that Jesus was alive. Of the men, at least Peter and John have seen the empty tomb and believed. And Mary Magdalene has even seen Jesus herself. The uh, funniest um, Facebook thing I saw during Easter said, if you want to stay biblically accurate at church this Easter, only allow women to proclaim that Jesus resurrected. All of this happened, and we've got that. Yet despite all of this really happening, the disciples are locked away due to the fear of the religious elite. Throughout Jesus' ministry, he's shown them he can do things that no one else has even thought of, has even considered. He can heal illness, injury and disease. He has authority over nature. He can walk on water and just by saying the words, the wind and the waves calm. But even though they've experienced all of this, the disciples' fear is still in control of how they respond to life. Now we definitely understand that, right? Don't we also let those things we're afraid of control how we respond to life? Oh, sure. There are things that jump out at us, scare us. Maybe we're afraid of heights and tight spaces. But there are other fears that control us as well. Some of us have jobs we love. A few of us fit our careers so well that we would do it for next to nothing, only what would require to just barely get by. But others have less of a choice. Their career is more of a necessity. And the fear of what would happen if they didn't go to work is really the only thing that drags them out of bed every morning. In some way, fear is often one of our top motivators. And I want us to think about where fear comes from and how fear plays out in our lives. One of the main places that creates fear is a part of our brains known as the amygdala. This is the part of the brain that controls how we respond to danger, whether we run away or whether we fight. And I want you to think about how that little part of the brain has affected us through all of the years, not only our years, but all the way back through our ancestors. See, for most of human history, there was always some creature or enemy that could pop out at any moment. This was the part of our brain that talked to us about, hey, this is one you got to fight out, or this is the one you got to get out of here. But modern psychology has pointed out that this small part of our brain creates problems for us in the modern world. We don't have the same kind of scary situations as our prehistoric families or even relatives that did scary things like settling our country. But the amygdala continues to tell us we need to fight, we need to run. And here the disciples perceive a threat and it may actually be a valid threat. But nothing in them is predisposed to process Jesus' resurrection and understand what it means in their situation. Fear is completely running the show. My hope for us as we continue to process how Jesus' resurrection affects our lives, that we continue to wrestle with what that means to us right now, today, in this moment, and tomorrow. I don't have any expectations that we should be at some certain point 
Even the disciples weren't able to easily flip a switch. But what Easter invites us to do is to walk into the feelings and the questions it creates and processes them with God and the Christian community that God has surrounded us by. Here's what I mean. I do a lot of funerals and weddings. I did a lot more pre-COVID, but you know I still do a fair amount of these things. And one of the most disappointing things I deal with in those situations is when people aren't processing what is going on. They aren't thinking about how this affects them long term. At weddings, this happens when people are only focused on the event. Now, the event matters. The event is a wonderful gift to friends and family. But when you aren't doing the work of preparing for marriage, down the road you might have some trouble. At funerals, this happens when someone is hurt or angry and isn't processing this in a healthy way. Now, let me define healthy way. I am very comfortable with somebody going all Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. There are moments when we need to have it out with God, and that is a biblical thing. We see this picture in Scripture. But when we rage internally, when we hold everything in, and we don't process it through with God, with the people that God has put around us, we don't give ourselves any chance to get at a better spot, to get at a chance where we're healed, to get in a spot where we can trust God even through the worst of situations. You see, Easter isn't a single event for us that fixes everything. Like we see in this scene, even though the disciples had already heard the truth and some of them had seen evidence of it, they were still allowing their fear to control their lives. The reality of Jesus' resurrection didn't free them. They continued to live out life as if some things mattered more than Jesus. And they were locked up as if they believed the religious elite had all the power. And what's the most important item in this text is Jesus comes to them. Now think about this. They are a mix of beliefs. Someone believed that, some of them believed that the resurrection had happened. Some of them were in this kind of, I'm not sure phase. And some of them said, no, nope, I'm not buying it. And Jesus meets them where they are to demonstrate his power. Now, personally, I don't know anyone who God has ever physically appeared to. Now, somebody may be sitting here who's going, Mark, I haven't told you my story yet, and that's possibly true. But I know lots of people, including myself, that God has made himself aware to us. God has shown us that he is present. Jesus, God in the flesh, meets them where they are and makes his call on their lives clear. In this first interaction, Jesus makes three things clear. Because of his work on the cross, humanity is offered peace with God. Now our salvation is wrapped up in this. Because of Jesus' faithfulness on the cross, we are now forgiven by God and free of the consequences of our sin. And this peace isn't just an us and God thing. It's intended to spread out into our world. I have a few friends that are better than me at living this out. They receive God's peace and they offer it to the world. And don't get me wrong, these aren't people that are perfect uh, but they are people that don't let the situations in life get them wound up like most of the rest of us do. The ones I'm thinking about care about things. They have political leanings, but they're really good at not le letting these things interfere with their relationships with others. Think about how often we live so much more like an act of war than a lifestyle of peace. I wonder on Easter how many of us had to actually plan for our day, plan how we would respond with our family and friends because we didn't want conflict to ruin the day. In contrast to how we live, Jesus offers peace. The second thing is he gave them the gift of the Holy Spirit. The power in the church is never about who we are ourselves, 
The power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God himself is the power of the church. What these people are going to be called to do in the next several years will require God's own power flowing through them. They are required to be Jesus to their world, to act like Jesus did to their world, to be like Jesus was for their world. Now, the third thing he did was he gave them the power to forgive. And my guess is that most of us here, if we struggled with anything in here, this is the piece that we struggled with. Remember, saying he could forgive sin was one of the things that got Jesus in trouble with the religious elite. But see, we're okay with Jesus saying that because we understand that he's God. But just passing this power out to others might not sit well with a lot of us. Well, we're we're understanding something correctly. God is the only one that can forgive sin. That is right. But God is calling his followers to do the ministry Jesus was doing all over the world. Our role in forgiveness is as an agent of Jesus. We don't do this on our own, but in line with Jesus' ministry and Jesus' power. When we do ministry, we do it the way Jesus did it. We offer forgiveness as Jesus had forgiven. The very last part of our text is a picture of how deep the questions about Jesus' resurrection went with the disciples. And I really think that the example of Thomas is one that we should regularly think about, we should regular, per, regularly process. Just like us, the accounts of Jesus' resurrection weren't accepted blindly by the disciples. The report actually created strife between them. And when Jesus revealed himself to the larger group, Thomas wasn't with them at that moment. And Thomas said to them, yeah, I'm not buying this until I see it myself. You see, the thing that we have to understand is so often um, in our experience in the church, we will have moments where we need to depend on the Christian community around us. We need to depend on the church around us. And sometimes we'll be a little worried about doing that. We'll be a little worried about, well, am am I sure they're telling me the truth? Am I sure that this is the right way? Will people dupe us? Yeah, they will. But if we get so cynical that we can't open ourselves to others' experiences, even if they're different than our experiences, we will miss more than we will receive. After Easter... God is still calling us. He's calling out our fear and he's calling us to respond to him. A call to him and a call to the greater world. It's our job at this point to continue the journey we took at Easter by walking into those places of doubt and fear. To receive Christ's peace and offer forgiveness of of our world and to trust and be trusted by our Christian community. Over and over, we need to have this experience where we understand who Jesus is, that he is our Lord, and we respond to him in hope and in trust. Let us pray. Resurrecting God, you open the tomb and invite us into the new life you offer us. Instead of living into that life, we fear what we perceive in front of us. We limit your power and your sovereignty. We place demands on your actions. Don't only forgive us, but heal us. Raise up in us belief in your resurrection. Help us to let go of powerless things that that we empower over us. Move in us and bring us into your presence. We continue to pray for the situation in Ukraine. Today is the second month of the war. Keep us from getting bored with this story. Open our eyes to other conflicts that we need to be more mindful of. We lift up those in our congregation and beyond our walls that are suffering. Bring your ability to heal into their bodies, minds, and spirits. Through Jesus Christ, whose wounds are not erased, but glorified in resurrection. 
Touch our wounds that they may be transformed into channels of healing for others. Holy Spirit, breathe into us the power to forgive so that all may have new life. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Today is a big day for our church family because it is Confirmation Sunday. Emerson Holtz and Kate Lundy are presented by the session for the reaffirming of the baptismal covenant into which they were baptized. They now desire to publicly profess their faith and to assume greater responsibility in the life of the church and God's mission in the world. Emerson Holtz is the daughter of Mark and Lynn Holtz. Hear these words from her statement of faith. When people think about the church, they might think of a building, but it is actually about people and God. The people who gather together to grow in their faith learn about God and apply it to their world. We can't do this alone, so we unite. It is where we develop powerful friendships with each other and with God. Kate is the daughter of Fred and Lisa Lundy. Hear these words from her statement of faith. Jesus is the Son of God who came to earth for the ultimate price of sacrifice which cleanses humanity of our sins. During his time on earth, cut short by his sacrifice, he performed many miracles. Much in the same way that he wildly multiplied bread and fish, he multiplied God's followers on earth. I hope every time we have a Confirmation Sunday that you are just amazed at the amazing people that we have in this church, at the gifts that God has given to us. And I hope part of your understanding of stewardship means uh, being there for these people as they grow in their Christian journey. In baptism, you were joined to Christ and made members of this church. In the community of the people of God, you've learned of God's purpose for you and for all of creation. You've been nurtured at the table of our Lord and called to witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hear these words from 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. Now, Emerson and Kate, I have a couple of questions for you. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church? If so, respond, I do. Do you no longer intend to follow, agree with, or support evil? If so, respond, I do. Do you acknowledge your need for and reliance on God's grace? If so, respond, I do. Do you desire to become a member of First Presbyterian Church and participate actively and responsibly in the worship, life, governance, and mission of the church? If so, respond, I do. Emerson and Kate, by publicly professing your faith, you've expressed your intention to continue the covenant God made with you in your baptism. It is with joy and thanksgiving we welcome you to share with us in the ministry of Christ as active members of this church. For in Christ we are all one. Let us pray. Gracious God, by water and the Spirit, you claimed us as your own cleansing us from sin and giving us new life. You made us members of your body, the church, calling us to be your servants in the world. Renew in Emerson and Kate the covenant you made in their baptism. Continue the good work you have begun in them. Send them forth in the power of your spirit to love and serve you with joy and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Let's welcome them into membership. Thank you. You can go back there. You can go back there.
before we affirm our faith together, um, we think about the confirmands, um, just really a sense of verse 28 in the preaching text, whenever Thomas answered, my Lord and my God, that is uh, the most important question we will deal with in our life. And if you've dealt with it and you've identified Christ as your Lord and your God, great. We are called to go look for other people that need to answer in the same manner. But if you haven't, if you personally haven't been able to say, Jesus is my Lord and my God, we're here to have those conversations with you. These confirmands have said it, and, and like most of us, we'll, they will have to continue to say it throughout their life as obstacles and life itself brings them with that opportunity. But as the church of Christ, that statement, that statement is why we exist. So if you need to talk to Mark or Scott or myself or anybody else in this church that has made that decision, please do. Please don't let too much time pass before you reckon where you stand before Christ. We would love, love, love to spend that time having that conversation with you. If you will please join me by standing as we affirm our faith together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. If you haven't already, please pass the fellowship pads down uh, your aisle so that your pew, so that everyone gets a chance to sign in. As we are reminded by Jesus, as we are reminded in this text of how easy it is to get your focus on the wrong things. How easy it is to believe what's wrong. As we have this time in the offering, we're reminded of where our hope and trust comes from. It's not in our gifts and abilities. It's not in our financial situation. Our hope and trust is always in a God that goes beyond what we are able to do.
Now let us continue with the words that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you are a college student, we invite you to our college cafe uh, right after this service in the North Courtyard. We'd love to buy you lunch. It's a good lunch. Scott does a good job taking care 
of his students. So catch up with Scott. Uh, just also, um, be praying for uh, students this week. This is finals week, so many of you remember how awful of an experience that was. And we just want to, you know, maybe you also pray, thank you, Lord, that I'm not going through this again. But, um, but be praying for them as well. The subtlety of fear wars against our souls. It wars against our ability of belief. It wars against our ability to be involved in Christ's kingdom work, of doing the work that Jesus did while he was here. Engage with that fear. But believe that a God who is greater, who showed himself greater than anything else imaginable, He's the one that has the power. He's the one who has the real control. Walk into that and walk into it not alone, but with others who God has placed around you so you can hope and you can believe. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine round about you and bring you hope and bring you peace. Amen. Join us at First Presbyterian Church Sundays at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary or live streamed on our website or watch us on My 11 every Sunday morning at 9.